Good morning, and thank you for having me here. Uh, as you said, I'm going to talk about mythology of big data, and I was originally going to do a slightly different talk, but then I did six different presentations, and we finally picked one last night. So uh, if you know me, you know that I typically do these talks, all of my talks, Ignite style. So 20 slides in 10 minutes should be no problem. Um, I, I chose this particular title and topic because I felt that there were a lot of assumptions underlying what people talk about with big data. Now, originally, I was really thinking about the Hadoop crowd and a lot of other things. And there's a lot more data people here who are not really married to things like MapReduce. Um, but uh, I think that it still applies. There we go. Um, my first point, then, is that every technology out there carries within itself the seeds of its own destruction. And I'm applying this really to the code technology, software. Software has set things up in such a way now that it's beginning to eat itself. And people who are programmers, people who started out programming like me, are having to go out and find other jobs. Um, this thing is not working. Can you advance the slides, please? Thank you. Um, code is a commodity. And you have to let that sink in for a moment. With code being a commodity, it means that things that a lot of people have set their careers on as well-paying jobs are starting to move down market. And if they're starting to move down market, then there has to be other value out there. And the, the process of coding is built up libraries, it's built up components, it's built up mechanisms that allow us to assemble code. So the new job of coding a lot of times, for most people, and I'm not talking about folks working at software startups, but most business is not a software startup, and that is glue code. You're writing code to stitch things together. Typically, when you are writing code to stitch things together, about 20% of the time, you're doing stitching of code for functionality. The remainder of the time, you're getting data from one point to another, from one hunk of code to another. So, you have to think about what the central myth is then underlying big data, because we've gone from code being commoditized and the fact that really code was data processing. The first iterations of code were actually about data. And what we have now is this whole big data market that just sort of erupted. Uh, it's really emerged slowly, but it's erupted over the past couple of years into the public spotlights, which this conference is a perfect example of. And that myth is the myth of the gold rush, the myth of the prospector. So there's so many people saying, I want to be a data scientist. I want to be an analyst. I want to be the guy who goes out and pans the stream looking for those little bits of gold. And once I find those little bits of gold, then um, I will you know, I'll be able to take these nuggets of insight back to my organization, and they'll you know, shower me with riches and prostitutes and all sorts of other things. Um, Booze. It's really about booze. Uh, the thing is that it doesn't work that way. In fact, with the gold rush in 1848, right? Gold rush was really 1848, but nobody believed it. So they went out and they found some people, in particular one guy, who was credible enough because he was an upright, non-drinking, non-whoring citizen. And he went out and said, there's gold. And then all of a sudden, everybody rushed out to California and Oregon and Washington and Alaska in 1849 did this and very quickly discovered that panning for gold is not a lucrative business. And they went into hard rock mining, which takes resources, dynamite, mule trains, heavy labor, and capital. And so all of a sudden, it became corporatized. And the myth of the lone developer with a PC putting up a website mining 10 terabytes of data starts to look a little bit suspect. The other thing is that most people do not work in businesses where data is the business. Uh, it, it's more that most of us work, and I do a lot of work with, companies that actually have physical goods that have to move from place to place, or we make stuff, or we dig stuff out of the ground. And in that kind of an organization, applying data means changing an organization, changing processes, finding ways to act with and through others in collaborative fashion, and that is not the lone prospector. So the myth that we have that gets publicized out there is actually doing us a disservice because it's telling us that you can go it alone when you can't. Um, so let's look at the evolution of data 
and, and kind of the modern data market, right? So the 1950s, the 1960s, and it even extends earlier, building firing tables, for example, uh, for the, the Navy, which is where things were. Data was a very vital product here. Um, data was the product. The whole focus of the organization that had a computer was getting those output tables. You get into the 70s and 80s and the mini computer revolution, and now we have data as a byproduct. Right? The core focus of that was not producing data, it was automating transactions. It was the Taylor industrial model being applied to transaction processing to automate clerical jobs, which worked, and it worked spectacularly well, which created a data capture problem that was later solved by assembling a lot of things. And then suddenly people said, well, we've automated the heck out of everything. What do we do now? And that was business process reengineering and all this other wonder wonderful stuff that came along. Use data as an asset to figure out how to modify processes to make them work faster, make them work better, make them more effective or efficient. Data became an asset. This was the business intelligence data warehousing boom that really started in the 80s, but it really crested in the late 90s and, and, and continues through today. It's not like anything ever just stops, it evolves. And now we have the position where most people do have that asset. In fact, we have an overabundance of that asset to the point where Bruce Schneier calls it data as pollution. And that's part of what his data privacy talk was about, is you know, there's a point where too much of something can become toxic. So we're really looking now at data as a substrate. And what I mean by that is data is the basis for competition. And everything is so different now because data as the basis of, con, you know, of, of competition underlying how you configure your business, well, everything is so different, just like it was back when they hired computers. This is a job for a computer. Uh, paid about $1,000 to $1,400 per year. Uh, you work for the civil service. Your grandmother was a data scientist. So if you really want to know how to become a data science person, uh, read this ad and then talk to your grandmother. So if we look at using big data, one of the things that we miss the point of is that it's not about big. There's a lot of useful data that is not 10 petabytes in size. There's a lot of data inside organizations. The bulk of data inside commercial IT is less than five terabytes in size. And that's seven years of data. Now sure, there's a lot of explosion of stuff, but okay, let's double that, let's triple that. It's still not gigantic volumes. And so big is not the important thing. And we get tied up in big way too much. The other thing is that it's not really about data. It's about applying data. If you're doing all this sophisticated analysis, if you're graphing beautiful pictures of your LinkedIn contact, contacts, and you don't have a way to apply that stuff, you're producing trivia. And there's not much you can do with trivia. So don't become the tabloid journalists of the data industry because that's not really what you, you want this to be all about. And besides, most tabloid journalists don't make a whole lot of money. Oops. Um, so I, I'm going to just throw some, some um, very early stage kind of high level business intelligence stuff from the business intelligence world, which today sadly means mostly uh, very basic things like reporting. Oops. Now it's just advancing on its own. And where is it going? I have no idea what's going on with these slides, but uh, is there a way you guys could actually roll things back for me to? Uh... Uh, you're going the wrong way. Uh, I need to go forward, and it's just clicked through my entire presentation. Thank you. Uh, is there any way you guys, uh, the guys behind the curtain, there is actually a man in a robe back there. Uh, if you guys could kind of go back about eight slides and then roll my timer a minute. Uh, uh, one, two, there about four more. Uh, maybe one more. One more. Okay. All right, so uh, now I get to go really, really fast, which is that... Uh, the question, the fundamental question, I'll, you download the slides, you can read the notes. Uh, how do you apply information in a business? And um, the operant decision-making models in corporations are political and bureaucratic. What that means is not a negative thing. It means that policy decides decision in a bureaucratic decision-making model. And horse trading, if we do your project this month, we'll do my project next month arbitrage, trading off of these things. That's the, the political model of decision making. And that's the operant mode for most corporations. And, and it's a reality. And so it's not logical. It is irrational. 
And data is contextual, right? There is no single version of the truth, as if you were in Barry's session yesterday, you kind of understand. The fact is that there are multiple contextual versions of the truth, and you have to debate those truths. And, you know, why my, my theory about this is better than yours, and we're going to do it my way. Uh, and that, of course, opens up the door to cognitive bias, which is a fancy way of saying your brain is not as good as you think your brain is. Um, so uh, who are the people making the decisions? Strategic, tactical, operational is this classification a lot of people use, which is really, you know, the executives, the middle management, and the rest of us. But it's more than that. It's that there are these natures of decisions that are high time span, pattern-based, fuzzy decisions that have very little or very weak analytic support because they're very collaborative and intuitive. Then there are, at the other end of the spectrum, very rote decisions. Procedure and process decide those things. And that kind of thing we call a programmable decision, not from a coding sense, but from a, a decision science sense, which is that they are something that can be encoded in rules and procedures that people follow, which is why IVR systems suck so bad. Because there's a lot of exceptions in the world, and if you don't adapt to those exceptions, then you won't be able to solve problems. And that is where the middle layer, the tactical decisions, <clears throat> happen. And if we look at what kind of support we have for these things, the, the process guys, you know, they have an exception. They operate within a process. When they can't, they escalate it up to their manager. Excuse me, I'll have to let you talk to my call center manager in order to resolve this problem. Please hold. And then they hang up on you. Um, the middle guys actually act to change a process. So they can act on process, which is different than acting in process. A lot of stuff you hear about ad serving and other things is the other side. It's the operational side. So the strategic decisions reconfigure processes and priorities and are very fuzzy, obviously. And so that creates things. What kind of support do these people have? The execs have other people. It's a very empowering thing. I've been an exec to call up somebody else for the data. At the other end of the spectrum, they have reports and dashboards. The guys in the middle who have sort of a fuzzy middle ground, they have email and meetings and documents and faxes. So the, the tool support is rather weak. And if you look at how you apply it, you apply it typically at any one of these areas. Execs make very few, very expensive decisions. People at the bottom make very frequent, low-value decisions that in the aggregate can turn your company. And the guys in the middle adjust and manage the exceptions of that process. Um, yeah. It's the clicker this time. Um, I just skipped over that last one, which, which is sort of a summary of this slide, which if you are a data scientist or you are purporting yourself to support data science people, I think the one paper that you should read that is only eight pages long is Paroli and Card, and it's called Sense Making. Actually, here, I'll read you the whole thing because I can't keep it in my head. The sense making process and leverage points for analyst technology as identified through cognitive task analysis which is a whole lot of $5 words that basically say that these guys sat down and figured out how people make sense of data, use it to convince other people, tell stories, and then work backwards from the story they've told in the debate about that data to build evidence. It is essentially the scientific process applied to data in a way that makes a whole lot of sense to me having been an analyst. And so I leave you with this because I think it's a very valuable thing. And, um, uh, the, the closing comment I'd just like to say is that most of us are tool makers or use tools. We succeed only as well as the users of the tools that we provide succeed with our aid. And since most of us are working or supporting corporations and corporate or organizational or political decision making, that's the stuff that needs to be supported and it needs to be supported through proper tools. It's not just about big and it's not just about data. Uh, Thank you. I am slightly over. <laughs>